What Rhoda Wise does for us is she points us to the cross. She loved the people that came. She wanted to help them. She embraced the suffering. She said, I want to do this. He had not been out of the bed in months. I mean, it truly was miraculous. She's going to be a saint. I have no doubt about it. Rhoda Weiss was born Rhoda Greer on February 22, 1888 in Cadiz, Ohio, to bricklayer Eli Greer and his wife Anna, the sixth of their eight children. She came from a very anti-Catholic family. She didn't hear anything good about the church while she was growing up. But Rhoda never kept that attitude in her heart. When she was two years old, the Greer family moved to Wheeling, West Virginia, where she was raised as a Protestant. She moved to Canton when she um, was older, before she got married. Rhoda married George Wise in 1917, and the couple continued to live in the Canton area. And being unable to conceive children, they adopted two daughters, one of whom died in infancy. She moved in there uh, with her husband, George, uh, who, after uh, uh, some tragedies in their life and suffering from the depression that we experienced in the United States at that time, we're going back to the 20s, 1920s, that uh, they ran out of money, you know. And then he had a, a severe drinking party. He was a full-fledged alcoholic. Their first adopted daughter died during the Spanish flu epidemic, just before her first birthday. Um, so he was unstable. You know, the depression came. Um, it was a, a, a time of struggle. George Wise was an alcoholic and changed jobs frequently, resulting in financial hardship and embarrassment for the family. They lost the, a home they had during the depression and end up, ended up moving back to the um, 25th Street property that was just a shack. The Wise family lived at seven different addresses by the early 1930s. They were occupying a three-room house near the Canton City Dump. Beginning in the early 1930s, Rhoda Wise developed serious health problems, including a 39-pound ovarian cyst that had to be surgically removed. I don't think they wanted to remove it because there weren't antibiotics yet, and it was a very risky surgery. The tumor was a benign tumor of the ovary, but it was large. and. Something you can imagine, 39 pound tumor uh, sitting in your pelvis, your lower abdomen, that's going to take a lot of space. It, you know, it's, it's, it's even bigger than you, know, you would have with a baby. Rhoda was hospitalized frequently and underwent a number of operations. That's a difficult surgery to go through. And in, in order to remove it, of course, you have to open the abdomen, be able to take it out and, and then sew her back uh, you know, together. But, but entering her abdomen, just that mere fact that you enter her abdomen means that there has to be a healing process that goes on. The natural response of the body is to form scar tissue, which sometimes causes these adhesions from which she suffered. During a 1936 stay at a Kent hospital operated by the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, she befriended some of the sisters who taught her to pray the rosary and told her about St. Therese of Lisieux. Rhoda began to pray regularly to St. Therese and also became devoted to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. She was able to uh, become a friend of several of the sisters. She was some, some, re some reason or other, she was attracted to the sisters. And even though she was not Catholic, you know, the sisters you know, would introduce her to certain devotions that touch our Catholic faith, like the Holy Rosary devotion to the Sacred Heart. She had the perfect storm, but she rose above it. And she rose above it because she was open to grace. Uh, the, the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine in Canton were really uh, just such a blessing to her. And it's almost as if the more she, she suffered, the more inquisitive she became. Uh, she, you know, each bout with suffering took her out in the deep. And as she went deeper and deeper into the depths of that suffering, God's grace overflowed and she embraced it. There was a really intense uh, relationship between um, Rhoda and Sister Clement. They really uh, locked spiritually. So um, I imagine that um, Rhoda's hanging on to Sister Clement's every word. 
I think that became the, the, the door openers to everything, you know. And she became more and more passionate in her desire uh, to become a Catholic, you know. The more she suffered, the more open she was to everything. And um, she was especially drawn to um, St. Therese because she did suffer too. In December 1938, Rhoda decided to convert to Catholicism and was received into the Catholic Church in January of 1939. Monsignor was the pastor of um, St. Peter's Parish, um, a very much loved pastor. They didn't expect her to live very long. Um, so when Monsignor gave her that catechism and she learned it so quickly, she was brought into the church within a week's time. She was fully Catholic, and that meant a lot to her. So I know that in spite of all of her sufferings, that was a very happy day for her. She was sent home by the doctors saying, we can really do nothing more for you. So she was sent home. In May 1939, Rhoda was diagnosed with a terrible stomach cancer and was discharged from the hospital and sent home to die. And the suffering, there was an infused knowledge um, that came to Rhoda um, to understand suffering the way she did. She understood it very deeply. Rhoda Wise claimed that she received an apparition of Jesus Christ on May 28, 1939 at her home, during which Jesus was said to tell her that he would come again with St. Therese the following month on June 28th. She's not getting any better. She's suffering horribly. Um, and um, so she was expecting him to come, although she was praying that she could live long enough to see her daughter older and, older and able to take care of herself. She woke to a light in her room. And when she turned to see what it was, Jesus was sitting in a chair by her bed. And she wasn't surprised that he was there because she was expecting to die. She went to touch him, and that's when he was gone. If you're going to assess a psychosis, then her hallucinations of Jesus, St. Therese, were circumscribed. In other words, from all reports, there were no other signs of psychosis. She wasn't delusional, she wasn't paranoid, she wasn't grandiose, she wasn't mixed up in her thinking, she wasn't illogical, she didn't make up words that nobody knew the meaning of, she wasn't loose. Everything surrounded these visitations. She would have healed from the surgery, uh, uh, from the uh, ovarian surgery. However, uh, the uh, other issues uh, of, of the adhesions would have occurred at, uh, as a result of the healing process. And so from 1931 through 1939, she had undergone, I believe, 14 surgeries and, and some other uh, bouts of uh, bowel obstructions that weren't surgically treated, that were treated more conservatively. Rhoda reported that Jesus and St. Therese both appeared on June 28th, and during their visit, cured her of her stomach cancer, including healing a large open wound on her abdomen caused by her multiple surgeries. St. Therese was the one who motioned for Rhoda to take the bandage off of her abdomen. And she put her hand there and said, you've been tried in the fire and not found wanting. Faith cures all things. And her abdomen was completely cured. She had been walking and stepped into a sewer and it broke her foot. And in the process of trying to heal the foot, she was placed in a cast. And every time they would take the cast off, her foot would be deformed. And so she went through a series of casts and recasts, and the foot would never heal properly. So I think she spent more and more time in the house, maybe even bedridden for prolonged periods of time. Rhoda Wise further reported that in August 1939, St. Therese miraculously healed her injured foot causing the heavy cast on it to split and fall off in the process. She received a locution from Teresa, get up, and she got up, and that's when that report that she gave witness to uh, that the uh, 
one of the several casts that she wore, it broke open. St. Therese also told her to go to church that day, and they didn't have a car, they didn't have any way to go. They got a neighbor to take her to Mercy Hospital Chapel, and she went to church that day, walked out of the house into the hospital without any problem, walked past her doctors and nurses. The medical community uh, was you know, quite skeptical of uh, Rhoda Wise's claims of having experienced miraculous healings of both her abdominal wound and her, her foot. Rhoda, on the other hand, was adamant, very adamant, that what she had experienced with her abdomen and with her foot, uh, these were actually miraculous healings. And her own surgeon, I, as I read in her story, believed at first that, uh, that uh, this may have been a miraculous healing for as many times as they may have changed the cast. The foot was always deformed, but after she's visited by St. Therese, now the foot is normal. Now she can walk on it normally. Uh, and uh, the cast, uh, I think, uh, may also offer some evidence. Well, after Rhoda's um, foot was cured, after that her husband stopped drinking. And that's what she used to tell people was the greatest miracle that our Lord worked for her. From 1939 to 1948, Rhoda said that she experienced regular apparitions of Jesus and St. Therese including a visit by St. Therese on January 2nd, the saint's birthday, every year. Rhoda reported visions totaling 28 at the time of her death in 1948. She was a very difficult, immature woman prior to these visitations. And then what they described afterwards was almost a complete personality change. Now I'm a shrink, people don't, personalities don't change. They change slowly without a conversion. Apparently she had some kind of deep conversion and her personality seemed to do an about face. Rhoda Wise was inspired by these visions to offer herself as a victim soul to save the souls of others, particularly priests and members of religious orders. In her final apparition of Jesus on June 28, 1948, Rhoda said that Jesus asked her to say the rosary daily for the conversion of Russia. The messages of Jesus um, was a call back to the faith um, the importance of uh, and the value of suffering. Her suffering didn't end with just the healing of uh, an abdominal wound or a deformed foot. On Good Friday, April 3rd, 1942, stigmata appeared on Rhoda's forehead and continued to appear and bleed at intervals over the next two years. Her first stage was uh, uh, some type of a crown of thorns that she felt in some little bruise marks that were around the head. It was during the war years, during the Second World War, um, and Rhoda offered that suffering for priests. You know, she suffered a lot of different kinds of things, but that suffering from the stigmata, she suffered for priests. In 1943, stigmata appeared on her hands, as well as her feet and her forehead. The bleeding stigmata were witnessed by many visitors to the Rhoda Wise home on a, a Good Friday where it opened up into three wounds, okay. And then on other Fridays, it opened up for her hands and her feet. And there was also uh, some, uh, tear, some dropping of the blood from her eyelids. Rhoda was uh, claiming that uh, Jesus had told her that she would suffer these additional sufferings that uh, she would have the uh, stigma on a regular basis, and uh, which uh, there's evidence that she did experience the uh, bleeding from her eyes and her hands. When she bled from all the wounds, they came gradually. Um, I think it was her hands and then her feet and then the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns bled profusely and she was in pain. Uh, Monsignor Habig allowed people to witness her bleeding. Her door was simply open, and she was, I understand, very hospitable to people. Uh, even in times uh, when that stigmata occurred in the later 30s, when she uh, had profuse bleeding, uh, you know, people would visit her in the hundreds. Some were moved 
by her expression of the stigmata. She did uh, develop uh, the stigmata, her bleeding from her eyes, her hands. Uh, there's evidence of, of the bleeding from uh, the dresses that she wore. She gives witness to that, you know. And others witnessed it too, as you read the books about her. People that who ministered to her wounds, uh, people that uh, helped bandage her and so on. All of a sudden, it was gone. They could not believe it, you know. She did have this bleeding and that it was witnessed by uh, multiple people on a regular basis. The suffering lended her to prayer, to contemplation, to acceptance. She did suffer intensely sometimes, and uh, but never complained. And I think it's that that people began to relate to. You know, you're one who suffers. I suffer too, you know. Can you help me? We don't have any evidence of, you know, that she did anything to cause any harm to herself to cause this bleeding. Uh, we never saw any evidence of any financial gain from any of these uh, claims or activities. Beginning with the forehead, then with the hands and the feet, and people would see this, uh, this blood of some were moved to participate in her suffering, in the faith. Others were just there to be curious. Some even made fun of what they saw, you know. But she never rejected any of them. She endured it, and I was very impressed with that. She was one who embraced suffering, that suffering became redemptive, and um, people were drawn to her. They were drawn to her holiness, to her fidelity. The stories of Rhoda Wise's experience spread far and wide, causing hundreds of people to write to her and visit her home seeking physical healing and other spiritual help. Large crowds also gathered outside the Rhoda Wise home on nights when she said that she was experiencing an apparition. They went in thousands to look at her, you know, lined up. Uh, outside waiting to view her and she allowed that to happen for the sake of giving witness to the meaning of suffering uh, that she was going through for the Lord. When Monsignor let people come to witness it because he felt they should, um, there would be a line all the way around the block of people that would file in and the house was so small they'd have to come in the front door file past her and go out the back door thousands in that tiny little house is not much bigger than this room why why would you do this what would be the gain for her I mean, obviously she was not in great health anyway so she would get fatigued she would be emotionally fried but she kept doing it. She's my grandmother. I was born on her birthday. When someone comes there and prays that with their heart and believes that our Lord and my grandmother can ask him for miracles, you know, they believed this. And they left, they left believing. And some got their miracles. Some got their miracles. I do remember a lot of the uh, crowds outside, you know, with busloads of people, and they would be standing in our front yard and all the way around and um, waiting for our Lord to come. She was very, very patient, and she loved the people that came. She loved them, and she wanted to help them. They wouldn't be coming there if they didn't have a heartache or something wrong, or we just wanted the belief in our Lord. Why would you, would you do that to your someone you knew or loved and ask you to help them? She could not turn them away. When the apparitions were occurring or when they were thought to be occurring, people would, would come out and be outside the home. So um, she responded to grace and that grace became contagious and others were drawn into it. Many come because they're believers. Their faith doesn't rise and set on the validity of what happened with Rhoda. But if in fact our Lord made a special visit, they want to know about it. They want to hear about it. I think that's why she had so many uh, 
thousands, literally, of people that came to visit her home. Daya grew up in North Canton, which is just five miles from here. My mother, of course, had close friends down here in Canton quite a bit, and they did a lot of telephoning. <laughs> and uh, so I think during those conversations, we would keep up on uh, how our things were going down here and about this uh, lady, Rhoda Wise. And uh, then uh, one day we had the opportunity, my, myself and I believe my mother was with me, we took her down to visit Rhoda Wise. It's uh, one of the most interesting days of my life. She was uh, in bed and uh, she showed me her, uh, her healing uh, that was cured and we, we talked with her at that time. And uh, there were not a lot of people around or anything like that, but it was very impressive. And again, very simple. She was a very simple person. There was, uh, at that very time, there were many who were very, very much impressed. I think it helped their faith, and uh, they were willing to spread that faith to those uh, am among them. Many people credited Rhoda Wise with miraculous cures after they had visited her home or received holy water from her home. And she developed a reputation as a miracle worker. Before Rhoda Weiss had passed away, many people had uh, uh, experienced what they claimed to be healings. I don't know how many of those things have actually been documented, but uh, uh, there have been counts of maybe one or 200 uh, claims of actual healings. There's much testimony, testimony and there are cures attributed to her as well. Mother Angelica had this encounter with Rhoda Wise when she was a young girl, about 19, and um, it changed her life forever. In 1943, Rita Rizzo, a Canton teenager who later became known as Mother Angelica, was taken to see Rhoda Wise by her mother, seeking a cure for Rita's painful chronic stomach condition. She had something called ptosis of the stomach. Now what that means is a dropped stomach where the, you know, the main uh, ventricle that goes into the stomach is stretched and therefore food can't pass through. She was having all kinds of difficulty digesting food. She was losing weight. She looked terrible. Her coloring was awful. She was seriously incapacitated. Her abdominal issues, losing weight, uh, probably beating her up emotionally pretty good. She even developed a lump in her stomach at one point, and uh, doctors had given her corsets. Uh, they suggested various suspension devices. None of this really was working. She'd have to go lay down because she was having such spasms in her stomach that it was so painful that she couldn't stand, much less eat anything. In desperation, May Rizzo, Greta Rizzo's mother, takes her to visit this purported healer, a woman named Rhoda Wise. And I believe Rhoda said, I want you to pray in Novena. And uh, Mother did. There was no uh, kind of grand gestures or anything. She simply handed Rita a prayer card. It was a nine-day novena to the little flower, St. Therese. Uh, mother Angelica left the house. She and her mother, her grandmother, prayed that novena. And at the end of that nine-day novena, something extraordinary happened that would change, really, Rita Rizzo's entire life. Mother had such a troubled life. And it was the first time she really felt um, God's touch upon her. And it changed everything for her to feel that love and um, just changed her whole attitude about life and everything and led to her vocation. She considered this an enormous turning point in her spiritual life and in her physical life. She claims the, the lump that she had in her stomach before vanished. She didn't have any more stomach pain. She could hold down food. But most importantly, Rita Rizzo saw this as an indication that God the Father cared and loved her particularly. Inexplicably, this rather in-depth uh, physical problem resolved itself and mother felt a calling. At the end of nine days of prayer, 
Rita's stomach condition suddenly disappeared. She eventually went on to become a nun and then the foundress of EWTN, the world's largest Catholic television network. If there hadn't been a Rhoda Wise, there wouldn't have been a Mother Angelica because her healing led to her vocation and EWTN and all the other awesome things that have happened because Mother founded that network. After suffering a stroke, Rhoda Wise died of hypertension on July 7, 1948, in her Canton home. During the two days prior to her funeral, over 14,000 people reportedly visited her. Monsignor was there, her family was there. When she died, it was a shock to everybody, maybe more to the family than every, anybody else because they had seen her recover from so many things miraculously that for her to be gone was a shock. Her faith was very plain, direct. It never was in contradiction to the teachings of the church in any way, shape, or form, but it was a simple expression. It was not the expression of a sophisticated, uh, uh, high-level theologian, which we all must respect, of course, but to see that simple faith lived out, and it was drawing people, drawing people over and over again. Well, Monsignor was very vocal about his support for Rhoda, which has been a great blessing. Um, and he, and he stood before everybody and said that he believed that um, she was now walking with her beloved Jesus and Little Flower. Monsignor uh, Habig, uh, who was the pastor at the time, was very receptive to her. I mean, he had been in the spirit of our Holy Father accompanying her. He brought her into the faith. And uh, obviously he found her to be credible. He found her to be a woman of faith. To this day, pilgrims from outside of Ohio continue to visit the miracle home of Rhoda Wise, even after her death, and credit her with miraculous cures. There's still exceptional ones, um, tumors disappearing, um, people living way past what doctors told them to expect. But there's also the simpler ones, like um, jobs for people that haven't had one, or babies, we get babies. I grew up in Canton, I was 14. My mother said, I want to take you to a woman's house. So I went. It's kind of curious. I approached it sort of like this. What's going on here? What is this? I saw the rose petals with the images on them. I saw the lights on a particular night that Jesus supposedly appeared. I saw the host in the huge five gallon holy water. I'm a shrink. So I am inclined to look at the power of the human mind. What the human mind can do in expectation of spiritual intervention, emotional belief, placebo effect. That's the way I looked at it. However, there seemed to be things that I couldn't explain even as a young boy. There are four main stages in the path to sainthood. When a cause is first opened, the candidate is termed a servant of God. Then when their life of heroic virtue is recognized by Rome, they are considered venerable. When one miracle through their singular intercession is found and validated by Rome, they are declared blessed that a second miracle makes them a saint. In November 2012, the Diocese of Youngstown began to conduct an internal investigation into the life and writings of Rhoda Wise to determine if she might be considered for sainthood. It's a matter of allowing the church uh, in her protocols and in her study and prayer to look at all of this and of course to um, allow this to happen in a step-by-step -step fashion. I represent the bishop as the Episcopal delegate in the investigation that we are conducting as a tribunal uh, under his auspices as bishop uh, regarding the uh, possible canonization of Rhoda Wise. You know, we're in the process now where Holy Mother Church is really looking at it and uh, with the hope that we can move this process forward so that one day, God willing, we can say Saint Rhoda Wise. The primary focus of uh, the possibility of being named venerable by the Holy Father, of course, is whether or not the person 
demonstrates a certain holiness of life, that that can be shown without any reasonable doubt, whether or not the person lived a heroic life. Bishop McFadden um, kind of took a wait and see approach. He was just exercising prudence because sometimes we can overreact and get caught up in the moment. I think that we always have to defer to, to, a, to a process of understanding and of scrutiny. And uh, that's why I think in many ways, um, saints aren't made instantly. It takes time to, to look at a story, to behold the grace, and to really understand everything that happened. But she was very obedient to the local bishop, you know. She never did anything in terms of her witness that was going on uh, for her love for Teresa, love for our Lord, uh, her ability to carry the sufferings. She never did anything that would be contrary to what the bishop uh, would say. In 2016, Bishop George V. Murray of the Diocese of Youngstown declared Rhoda Wise a servant of God as a first step towards her possible canonization as a saint in the Catholic Church. Among the, her great virtues were her um, the, the uh, willing to suffer. She did a lot of suffering and uh, she put up with a lot. You know, her husband being an alcoholic, for example, uh, and uh, she uh, seemed to uh, uh, well, to suffer through uh, the difficulties she had because she lived in very poor circumstances. What Rhoda Wise does for us is she points us to the cross and there can be, no one can be a disciple without the cross. I pray every night to my grandmother, every night. She's probably tired of hearing from me, you know, but I do pray for her, you know, to her uh, and ask her for support, guidance, uh, help. In July 2018, the results of the diocesan investigation were submitted to the Vatican. The cause is working on the Positio Now, an academic position paper which details the research of the cause into the life and virtues of the candidate for sainthood. We have to base everything upon the truth. There cannot be any reasonable doubt in any way, shape, or form. So if there's any doubts that would surface, they have to be, everything has to be investigated. Someday, if the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints declares that Rhoda Wise lived a life of heroic virtue, she will be declared venerable. The Dicastery for the Cause of Saints continues to look at this, um, along with um, the help of our tribunal, and we allow this to unfold over time. I certainly um, am reverential to Holy Mother Church and, and what, uh, what, how she proceeds and, and what she will ultimately say. I can tell you, as a bishop uh, living in this local church where Rhoda Wise lived, that we do have testimony of her holiness, of her just special sense, a, truly a grace-filled woman. I think um, when you look at her life of suffering and how she embraced it, I, I find it to be very uh, heroic, inspiring, uplifting. Two miracles found through her intercession and validated by Rome will lead to her beatification and then canonization. There's just hundreds of documents of, uh, that we have already written outside the, the formal, in, the formal uh, investigation of the congregation, the favors granted by her. Uh, and there are people praying to her and favors being granted. Uh, uh, they do come up over and over again. The miracles must be medical healings of a serious condition, not liable to go on their own. The cure must be instantaneous, complete, and lasting. And perhaps most difficult of all, there can be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. The miracle is kind of the proof of the pudding. I'm putting it in a rather layman terms, but I think that's the best way to put it. And then sainthood requires still another miracle too. You know, so again, another proof of the pudding, so to speak. Mark and Betsy's story um, is a great favor. Everything changed for that situation. Mark Schoeg was diagnosed with stage four sarcoma in 2018. His prognosis was grim. 
I would say that if somebody asked me, do I believe in miracles, I would say, A, I haven't thought about it much, and uh, B, um, if push came to shove, probably not. I've been a physician since I've been 25 years old. I went to Yale Medical School. I went to, you know, I, I, I studied with some of the, with Nobel Prize winners. My health uh, was good before the condition. I, um, uh, I did not smoke. I did not drink. I did all the right things that you're supposed to do. I went for physical exams. I never told him because I didn't want him to become more fearful. Um, but that sixth sense within us, I just knew something was wrong. What I did have was more discomfort uh, than anything else in my abdominal region. And I noted I was getting weaker. Um, yeah. And um, I just, I had, you know, always been reasonably strong, but things that I could do before were becoming more difficult. A physician who was a uh, chief of urologist at a uh, well-known hospital in this area, um, he told me he did not believe it was my prostate. He sent me for an MRI. I know that MRIs usually take about 15 minutes. I was in the on the MRI table for at least an hour and a half which I knew was not a good sign. Within a couple of days, I had an appointment with the oncologist. He said, you have uh, something like 45, 47 tumors in your lung that have broken off from the massive tumor in your abdomen, that the tumor in your abdomen has invaded your bladder, your liver, uh, your colon, and your prostate. You have a choice of uh, not doing anything and just um, sort of getting your things together for hospice and saying goodbye, or we could put you on, uh, you know, high dose chemotherapy, which um, would probably buy you a few months. Once I saw that my jaw dropped, I didn't think he'd have the strength to carry on, to be honest with you. I got him in the car and we drove to the parish that we belonged to. And ironically, Father was outside stringing up lights and um, I just started sobbing. And you don't remember what you said to him, do you? you? You said to him, you said, just take care of her because I'm not gonna be around. And actually, Father, um, he started praying over both of us and you just kept saying, take care of her. I felt hopeless and devastated. To death sentence, uh, you're thinking this isn't fair, this, why me? Um, uh, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, I, you know, you people may think because you're a doctor that you're <clears throat> mobilizing your resources and that sort of thing, but um, you're a person first. I had three straight days of eight hours straight of that chemotherapy, and um, I have never been that weak. I, I, I mean, I could not speak. I had no ability to, I was too weak to speak. I could not eat, I could not sit up, I could not do anything. Chemotherapy left him with all kinds of additional complaints chronic fatigue syndrome, unable to walk long distances, shortness of breath, hypertension, tachycardia, uncontrollable sweat, unable to eat solid foods, unable to sit upright, and other health issues. We were all devastated. Um, and shortly thereafter is when he became weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, he became so weak that within just a couple of weeks, he was literally no longer able to walk. I was open to anything. I was feeling like um, uh, torn between, okay, I'm going to stick this out for six months to, um, you know, it wouldn't be so terrible if I died in my sleep tonight. You know, when you're suffering, you want to, or at least I did, wanted to hear of um, something to give you hope. Uh, something or even just somebody who else has been in the mm -hmm. same situation 
And Betsy would read to me uh, Rhoda Wise's diary. Mm -hmm. I would say, look at how much Rhoda suffered and she was okay. And you know, in retrospect, like, isn't that bizarre? Because uh, when I was saying, when I was reading him her diary, so that he could understand the gravity of her situation and how much she suffered, he could realize at that point in time that there were people who suffered as horribly as he was. But we really didn't know that he would come through this. He just continued to deteriorate rapidly. And um, I looked at him. I knew he was dying. Clinically, I, I work in the ICU. He was dying. Not being able to stand up or not being able to sit up or even roll over so that you can comfortably change your shirt, it's physically and emotionally devastating. I was praying every single day, asking God to guide me through every single day. And one day I just said, I have to go down to Rhoda Wise. And I was gonna bring Mark with me. I could not get him in the car. He was too sick. I couldn't even stand him up. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna take a sweaty t-shirt and I'm gonna put it on the chair that Jesus sat on at Rhoda Wise's home. And, and that's how I will get Mark to Rhoda Wise. Literally, not him, but the shirt that he wore, that he sweated through. So that's what I did. This very nice lady who was at Rhoda Wise that day said, what's wrong? And I said, I have something terrible. And she said, no, no, it's gonna be okay. And I said, no, you don't understand. It's not gonna be okay. I said, my husband's actively dying. He's dying right now. She said, no, no, it's gonna be okay. I personally did not wanna sit in the chair that Jesus sat in because I don't feel worthy. Um, but I definitely wanted divine intervention, literally. So I brought the shirt, the sweaty shirt down to Rhoda Wise's home and I put it in the chair and I prayed. When she came, um she tearfully brought the, her husband's shirt in and set it on our Lord's chair and, and begged for his life. And um, our Lord obviously heard. I remember just her, you know, bringing the shirt to me and I remember, most I remember her affect. I put it next to him in the bed. And I remember feeling a little stronger you physically got up and walked. I realized I had been stuck in the same room looking at the same four walls. We have a beautiful yard, but you know, looking the same scenario. And I kept saying to myself, boy, I'd love to go to, <laughs> I'd love to go to a supermarket so I could maybe see somebody, you know? And I said, okay, let's go. But I was thinking, there's no way he can go. He's too weak. And she looked at me, she probably thought I was crazy. And I said, no, we're going to the supermarket. He stood up, like he really did. I couldn't believe it. It had been months yeah. since he was able to walk. He had not even been to the bathroom without the use of a wheelchair, a tilt back wheelchair. I mean, it truly was miraculous. And then when I pulled up to the door, He's like, I want to go. And I thought, I'll get the wheelchair. He said, I don't want the wheelchair. I walked into the store, and right as you walk into the store, there's a little cafeteria, and there was a good old mm -hmm. friend sitting in a, a wall I mean, somebody yeah. I hadn't seen in, uh, you know, years, just sitting there having coffee. I just remember thinking I can't believe it and I finally had a different day. Time had passed since the physician saw Mark and we saw him and he said where's the wheelchair and I said we don't use it anymore. He goes what? I go no you don't understand he's like great he's doing awesome and he said are you sure? And we said, yeah, he's really doing great. He doesn't need it anymore. He was shocked. The doctor was absolutely stunned because the last time that he saw Mark, Mark was so sick he couldn't even sit up straight. Now, Mark was actually able to walk himself in without using any support in and out of the doctor's office. And he was shocked. He was truly dying and um, 
it is a miracle. How do you go from from that to this? When he was so sick, and we would go to that waiting room where there were, I mean, at least 50 patients with yeah. the same disease that he had. And, and it's a rare disease and it's a bad disease. He was always the sickest patient on that floor. It, it wasn't even that I felt bad for myself. I was just so sick mm -hmm. and it was such a struggle. And then, after our miracle, I remember, I said to you, and I don't know if you remember this, we were in the waiting room and I said, you're not the sickest patient anymore. I said, you're actually the best looking patient, meaning healthy. I, no, I mean, it was night and day. It was huge. And, and here he still is. I'm almost five years out from six to 12 months. And what was, you know, well over 50 tumors has shrunk down to five and, um, you know, now they're talking about it possibly being a chronic disease instead of something that kills me. And, um, you know, when the thought of being alive five years later was ridiculous, now mm -hmm. they're saying, you know, who knows, you could be alive 10 or 15 years. I mean, it's very much like Roto Wise's mm -hmm. story. I feel bonded and I mm -hmm. feel like I have had a miracle happen to me. I pray to Rhoda Wise every single day. I do. Um, there's a beautiful prayer uh, that I got actually from Rhoda Wise's home, and I say it every day. He gets up and he walks when he had not walked in months. How do you explain that? I didn't change anything else at home. There was nothing else that changed. He didn't get any new meds or anything at all like that. It, how do you explain it? Uh, I have a quality of life that I never thought I'd have. I walk the dogs. I. Uh, I see my grandkids uh, play basketball. Um, I, Betsy and I go out to dinner. We've seen our son uh, graduate high school. Um, these things were not supposed to happen. I went from somebody who believed that science could explain everything and that we would get all the answers to somebody who now, who now believes that science cannot explain everything and, and that there are miracles. I've always had tremendous faith. So as far as changing my faith, my belief in miracles, I can't say that it has because I always did believe. I just never thought I would personally experience. Anytime anyone reaches out to me for help because they know of our journey, I do tell them go to Rota Wise and believe in Rota Wise. I mean, his experience is, is miraculous. What else can I say? I mean, that's just what it is. Betsy's always come back practically monthly since. So we would get constant updates on how Mark was doing and and how, how very intently she was praying for him. And um, it's been five years now and um, she still has her husband. Rota Wise uh, sainthood will be determined by uh, experts in the Vatican, but I I firmly believe that Rota Wise is a is a saint. Um, I, I personally have seen it and felt it, and uh, and I see her uh, in action uh, even today. When someone in your midst, it's a tremendous honor and privilege and august uh, grant to the whole people of God in a diocese that is supposed to be one and holy and Catholic and apostolic. That someone is lifted up and say, he or she is now a saint of the church, says the Vicar of Christ on earth. I believe that uh, someday uh, through God's grace and the uh, interest of the people, she will become a saint to have uh, had the privilege of being there to see her and to uh, speak to her. And, uh, and then of course, to, to follow her, uh, her life uh, down through the, through the uh, years and uh, what's happening in her case. So I pray that, uh, I think it would just be a wonderful uh, thing. I can't make that call. But if I were a betting man, I would say, yes, yeah, she's with our Lord. She's going to be a saint. I have no doubt about it. No one, no one, that only God could know what she went through. And she did it for him and for us. People need to know there's hope out there 
and miracles do happen. I think Rhoda Wise was a disciple in the true sense of the word. Jesus says, deny yourself, follow in my footsteps, and pick up your cross. And um, Rhoda Wise not only picked up her crosses, but she kissed the cross again and again. Without that healing, Mother Angelica would not have pursued religious life, would never have founded the monastery in Birmingham, Alabama, and might never have built EWTN. I believe Rhoda is a saint because of all the petitions that I bring to her every day, whether they're small or large, I have gotten um, surprising and wonderful answers. Um, I believe she's a close friend. She's a saint. I'm Michael O'Neill. Thanks for watching.